Hey everybody and welcome to chapter number 13. We're talking about problem solving. Um, so uh, this chapter is kind of about what you would imagine. It is about problem solving, yes. Um, but I am kind of changing things up a little bit. Um, this, this chapter I guess is technically problem solving and creativity, but if you notice in the book, um, the section on creativity is actually very, very short. So uh, we're going to go over that a little bit, but we're not going to go into it in t too much detail. Instead, we're going to be uh, pivoting a little bit to cover some stuff from chapter 14. We're not going to cover chapter 14 as its own chapter. And what you need to know from chapter 14, we're going to cover uh, here today. So um, don't feel like you have to, to read that chapter. Um, yeah, but you'll see that a lot of the info that I go over is covered in that chapter. Um, it, which means that that'll leave us with chapter 15 left to cover. Um, uh, so let's get, uh, so what will we talk, I should probably say, what are we talking about here? We're talking about problem solving. We're going to look at some ways in which we do solve problems. Um, so we'll be looking at how we use like mental shortcuts to do that versus learned experience. And then we will also talk about having the right mindset going into problems and how that can uh, be super helpful. Um, so when we talk about problem solving, um, Really, I, I feel like another way to think about this is kind of like um, problem solving is anytime you're trying to achieve a goal, right? And so if you're thinking about this in terms of goals, uh, problems can become s pretty much anything, right? Uh, if you want to think about it, you can think of problem solving as like doing well on an exam, doing well in this class, that those are problems to solve. They are goals that you can achieve, right? So thinking about that, you know, like, how would you get an A in this class? Or how would you get a B or whatever your target grade is? Um, if I were to ask you, you know, like, well, ha what would you do if you wanted to make an A in your, uh, you know, Psych 308, Psychology for, uh, Statistics for Psychologists, um, what would you do? Uh, you'd probably say like, oh, you should study, you should make flashcards, you should get a tutor, you should get um, a study group or whatever. Any of those ideas are ways you're potentially solving a problem. So it's not just crossword puzzles or sudo sudoku or, uh, or riddles or stuff like that. Problem solving c can be kind of applied to anything, really, um, uh, depending on how you, well, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but because it is so so diverse, the reason why I wanted to kind of like mention that up top is because a lot of what we're going to be looking at in this lecture is going to be like puzzles and riddles and stuff like that, which is only a small, you know, you typically don't deal all that much with those in the real world. Anyways, problem solving is all about achieving goals, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It usually means that there is some kind of obstacle to get through or some kind of criterion you have to reach. Um, is problem solving unique to humans? If you think about this again as goals, then problem solving is not unique to humans, right? Because, um, you know, I, you can probably see my dog sleeping over there right now. You know, if he wanted to um, to get some water right now, um, that is a problem that he can solve, right? He, well, how he, how could he do that? Well, he could sit there and wait. That's one solution, right? Or he could start pawing at the door, or he could come up to me and start like whining for attention, right? Those are three separate behaviors that might potentially solve that problem that he has. So it's not unique to humans. But I wanted to give you a couple of examples of kind of some cool um, uh, videos of, of animals doing problem solving in ways that you might not expect. So the first I'll talk about here uh, is uh, pigeons in a Skinner box. If you click this link, what you're going to see is uh, something like this. You got a, a box and then you got uh, this kind of uh, um, little cube inside the box. You got your little pigeon friend. Um, ooh, that does not really look like a pigeon, does it? That well, looks, well, looks okay. Y'all don't judge me. Um, you can, can you do better? Yeah, you can do better than that, but you can still. Um, and then kind of a target or you know something that the pigeon needs to peck in order to get food. In this video, it's a banana. And so the question is whether or not this pigeon can, can move this box over so that it can step on top of it to reach that target so it can get rewarded for it. That is problem solving, right? This video about crows in a Japanese city is also problem solving, and honestly, this this video blows my mind. Um, I hope you I hope you check it out. I'm not going to spoil it for you, uh, but crows are smarter than people think. Um, even when you're told that crows are smart, crows are still a little bit smarter than that. 
Uh, and then finally this video here is about monkeys and cooperation and monkeys and their sense of fairness. So you can see some capuchin monkeys uh, here and um, they, uh, when I show this in the classroom people laugh and say "oh" and things like that. So if you got time, check it out. It's examples of problem solving in non-human species, but mostly what we're going to be talking about uh, today is going to be humans. So let's talk about picking the right strategy. and. Much like when we were talking about this in chapter ooh, chapter 12 with decision making and in the memory chapters, I'm going to be showing you how decision making goes wrong. And this isn't to say, you know, like, oh, humans are bad at decision making. That's not the point of all of these examples. The point of these examples is that these examples show the slight ways that, like, we make errors in our problem solving. And because we see that we consistently make errors here, that tells us a lot about how we normally solve problems. So to give you an illustration here, we have, um, and you may have seen uh, this, this puzzle before, the puzzle of the chicken, the bag of grain, and the fox, which you can see here. How cute. All right, so here is the problem. You are at a river and you are with a chicken, a bag of grain, and a fox. You have to cross that river. You're in your with a canoe, so you can get you can get by, but you can only take one of those things with you at a time. If you leave the chicken with the grain, the chicken is going to eat the grain. If you leave the fox with the chicken, the fox will eat the chicken. So the question is, how do you get everything intact, right? So let's you know take a, a quick second to imagine this river. So we got this river, and then we got, ooh, today's going to be a good day for artwork from an underqualified psych professor. Um, all right, so we got, okay, whew, I got that. Okay, so there, we got the, the bag of grain. Uh, now we need the chicken. Uh, that's going to be easy. I've been drawing chickens since I was a little boy on a farm. Um, and I'm still not very good at it. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we got our chicken right here. Actually, that's not so bad. Uh, and then finally we have the fox, and I have no idea how to draw a fox, so I'm just going to do, like, it's got crazy ears. All right, cool. That's just its, its head. All right. Um, and, I'm, all right, I'm going to, I got to do the rest of the body, right? Okay, there we go. Uh, so that is our fox. Okay, so we need to take these three things across the river. We have a canoe to do that. So which of these do you take across? Um, so I want you to take a quick second and try to do this mentally on your own. Just try it out. Um, see how far you get. Um, so for example, uh, let's pick one of these at random. I'm going to take this bag of grain across in my canoe. Then I'm going to go back and I'm going to get the chicken. But if I bring the chicken back, and I go back for the fox, I'm now leaving the chicken and the bag of grain on this side, and this chicken is going to eat that grain. So I can't do that. All right, so let's see. In that case, oh, and I couldn't have done that to begin with because that fox is going to eat the chicken. Okay, so I can't, <laughs> I can't take the bag of grain. I have to take the chicken first. So I'm doing that first, which means that I have the fox over here and the grain over here. So I'm going to go back, and let's say this time I'm going to get the, the fox. When I get the fox and bring it back, I can't do that because it leaves it with the chicken. So what happens if I take the grain? Oh, shoot, if I come back and get the grain, it does the exact same thing. What do I do? Uh, all right, so the way that you do this, this, and I have the text here, but I feel like it might be more helpful to kind of see me draw the lines. Here's how you solve this. You take the chicken across first. We already established why. Uh, now, when I go back, it doesn't actually matter which of these I, I go for. I'm going to go for the fox, though. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to grab the fox, and I'm going to come back. And you may say, wait, wait a second, Professor Daniel. You just tried that, and it didn't work. But here's the kicker. Instead of leaving the chicken and the fox on this side, I'm going to take the chicken back, leave the fox over here, and then I'm going to bring the grain with me over here, and then leave the bag of grain, because they're not going to interact. Foxes famously don't like grain. Um, they're gluten-free. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to go back, get the chicken who's left all by himself, and then come back, and then boom, I have all three. All right, so that is the solution. Students generally hate it whenever I point out the solution here, because they feel like I've cheated in some way. And when I say, how did I cheat? They say, wait a second, I didn't know you could take something back across the river. I don't know, man. It looks like it's. It looks like it says 
I, you can only take one with you at a time. It doesn't say anything about like you can you have to leave it there or whatever. But we kind of assume so, right? Um, and this is what the book refers to as the hill climbing strategy. Um, you hear this also called um, you hear it called backup avoidance. So sometimes you might hear me referring to this as backup avoidance. But essentially, what this is is the hill climbing strategy is that every single time you make a behavior, you do a behavior, and you have some kind of progress in this problem, you don't want to go back. You don't want to get further away from your solution, right? Uh, to think about that in in academic terms, you know, I mentioned that like doing well in a class could be seen as problem solving. This would be kind of like, hey, if you want to make an A in this class, you got to make a C on this quiz. You can't make a B or an A. You got to make a C. That wouldn't feel right, correct? You know, that, that would feel strange because by making a C, it feels like you're getting further away from where you need to be. So. A hill climbing strategy, the reason why the book refers to this as a hill climbing strategy is, is essentially like if you're trying to get to the top of a hill, um, you can imagine, you know, whenever you're a kid and you're trying to march up a hill, you'll be going, and if it's a steep hill, you'll be going up and then there'll be this point where you can't keep moving. So you might move a little bit to the left, or a little bit to the right until you get a little bit further up, and then you're going to try to see if you can get further up from there. Um, generally speaking, we don't start going up and then start going down and around and then going back up, right? Um, we usually try to keep moving upwards and forwards. Uh, that is a tendency that we have, and that is why this riddle is tricky, uh, is because we don't want to revert back to that previous state of things. We don't want to get further away from what we perceive to be the solution. And it feels like taking that chicken back across the river is like taking a step back and getting kind of back closer to where we started. And it does look like that, it does look like that superficially, but uh, that's the only way to solve the problem. Um, okay, so means ends analysis here, and and I should mention by the way that uh, this is refer you know like this is an example of using heuristics for for problem solving. The hill climbing strategy is a mental shortcut that we do, and most times it gets us through. Most times this helps us solve a problem, but this is an example, like I said, of how how you can see problem solving go awry uh, because we are doing this kind of natural tendency that we have um, uh, and it's not helpful in these circumstances. So means ends analysis is another kind of mental shortcut system uh, that we use to solve problems and the idea here is that if hill climbing doesn't work then we might kind of, we might be able to go back take it or take a step back and reevaluate where we are. Um, so this is means ends analysis which is when we are solving a problem, and we get to a point where things aren't working, we try to identify what the next sub goal should be, what the next smaller problem to solve is so that we can solve the larger one. So thinking about the, the chicken, the grain, and the fox, you know, the sub goal should essentially be we want to get one of these things across and then we want to find a way to secure, now that the chicken is over here, how can we bring one of these over here where they don't eat each other? So creating that sub goal like that, thinking about it like that, instead of thinking about the big picture, drilling down on that smaller piece might help you kind of unlock the secret here, which is that you have to bring the chicken back across the river. Um, so the key difference here, as I mentioned, is that once you kind of choose a uh, problem solving behavior, if it doesn't work, if bringing the fox doesn't work or bringing the grain itself doesn't work whenever you first try it, um, you don't have to necessarily abandon that behavior. What you're going to do is you're just going to put it aside, try some other ones until you get to that, you know, you, you achieve that smaller goal, and then you'll kind of re examine the, the problems, or the, sorry, the problem solving behaviors you tried earlier uh, that didn't work. So you can try to reuse a solution uh, in this case. So here's an example of means ends analysis. You got this dog right here, um, and so he wants to get this dog dish that has a bone in it, right? And so the the, the shortest distance is if he were to go through this fence, correct? So the hill climbing strategy would essentially be like, keep pushing on this fence until you get close enough, as close as you can to this, right? Um, but if we use means ends analysis, then it's the sub goal is, okay, um, well, I can't get it to, I can't get to it from here, so I need to find a way to get to this other yard, right? Uh, and so that would be easily just kind of sidestepping this and going that way. Um, so that might be kind of a very simple uh, example of means ends analysis. This example, the Tower of Hanoi, might be a little bit more illustrative. 
Um, so if you haven't played this before, uh, it's kind of a common puzzle. Uh, so you have a certain number of discs here. You got these bigger ones and you have these smaller ones up top. And the, 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 the instructions here are that you need to move all five of these from peg A over to peg C. Sounds easy, right? But here's the thing. You can only move one at a, oops, sorry, hold on. One at a time. And the other thing, so you can only move one of these discs at a time. But the real kicker is that you cannot place a larger disc on top of a smaller disc. And I'm not gonna write that here because it'll take me all night to do that. Um, because you know how slow a writer I am. Uh, so I can't place this on top of this one in peg B because that would, let's say, crush the smaller one. So how can we get all of these over here over to peg C? Again, I will give you a quick second to think about it to kind of maybe pause the video and try to work out mentally, you know, how you might do that. Okay, thank you for pausing and for trying that out. Here is a GIF that will show you uh, essentially how to do this. This one has four discs, but you can use this strategy with any number uh, of, uh, of pegs that you have. It just takes a little bit longer, but that's how you do it. So much like the previous time, the, the, the chicken, the fox, and the grain, this relies on the hill climbing strategy to screw us up because as you'll see here okay this looks fine this looks fine that looks okay that looks okay wait a second what's going on here this is the spot that's kind of strange right and the reason why it's strange is because for a moment we have a lot of, of discs over here which feels good and then we start moving them all the way back over here to try to solve that and that feels wrong because we are violating our sense of hill climbing. Instead, we have to employ means and analysis. If we start thinking about this in terms of, okay, how can I get this green peg over here? And I'm going to prioritize that over anything else. That can help you unlock the solution here. There was a great article from the 80s that kind of did this exact same task. And, and what they did is that they told half the participants to try uh, means and analysis. They, they, they specifically told them, we want you to try to get this larger, lower disc over to peg C, uh, prioritize that. And what happened is that the, the participants that were doing the means and analysis like that, that were given that, that little secret instruction, that little secret hint on how to, how to approach this problem, they solved it faster than those uh, that were just kind of relying on um, their mental shortcuts, like you did whenever you were trying to solve this. Uh, so means and analysis can be helpful, but so don't forget about it, because a lot of people forget about it whenever they are solving these kinds of problems. Think about breaking it down to its subcomponents so you can try to prioritize uh, that way. Okay, so that was all about solving problems with heuristics. Let's talk about solving problems with our experience. Um, if we have encountered similar experience, similar problems in the past, we might try to use those solutions that worked for those problems on the current problems that we have now. So for example, if we're thinking about, you know, getting a good grade in this class as a problem that you can solve, uh, then if flashcards worked really well for you last semester in social psychology, then you might try to use that this semester, right? Because you have that experience. Um, but that's that's kind of an obvious example of how experience can help us, right? We're just generalizing at that point. So here is an example. So here is a problem, and I'll read this aloud. Suppose you are a doctor faced with a patient who has a malignant tumor in his stomach. Uh, to operate on this patient is impossible, but unless the tumor is destroyed, the patient is going to die. A kind of ray at a sufficiently high intensity can destroy the tumor, but unfortunately at this intensity, the healthy tissue that the rays pass through on the way to the tumor will also be destroyed. At lower intensities, the rays are harmless to healthy tissue, but will not affect the tumor. How can the rays be used to destroy the tumor without injuring the healthy tissue? So I remember the first time I, I saw this puzzle, it was not in this class, it was actually in something, I think in sometime in maybe grad school that I had seen it. Um, and I couldn't really figure it out. I tried all this weird like math stuff and like had involved mirrors and stuff like that. And that's not gonna, that doesn't really solve it. So if you need to, if you wanna think about it, you know, pause it and think about it for a second. 
and then I will reveal the answer to you in a moment. But before I do that, I want to give you a second problem. So if you're still trying to figure this one out, if you still haven't figured out the answer here, let me, let's just explore the second problem. And again, I'm going to read this out. I'm sorry, but I think it's necessary. A dictator ruled a country from a strong fortress, and a rebel general, hoping to liberate the country, vowed to capture the fortress. The general knew that an attack by his entire army would, uh, entire army would capture the fortress, but he also knew that the dictator had planted mines on each of the many roads leading to the fortress. The mines were set so that small groups of soldiers could pass over them safely, since the dictator needed to move his own troops to and from the fortress. However, any large force would detonate the mines, blowing them up, and also destroying the neighboring villages. Now, the rebel general knew about this, and so, he couldn't just march his army up uh, the road to the fortress because that large army is going to detonate the mines. Instead, he devised a simple plan. He divided his army into small groups and dispatched them each group, uh, in, sorry, and dispatched each group to the head of a different road. When all were ready, he gave the signal, and each group marched up a different road to the fortress, with all of the groups arriving at the fortress at the same time. In this way, the general captured the fortress and overthrew the dictator. Okay. So this gave you a problem, and it also gave you the solution. Now, if we look back at this problem, does that help at all? Does the solution we just did, could you apply that here? If it's not obvious to you, just give yourself a quick minute, pause it, and, and think about what the lessons of this do, breaking off into these smaller components, and then meeting in the middle. How would that solve this? Okay, so if you are stumped, Think about that. So here we have that laser, that ray, right? And we know that if it's at full power, that it's going to go through the tissue and that's bad. Uh, it's going to kill the tissue. Um, so the way that we would do this is that we would have it at a lower, have these rays at lower intensities and have them maybe, let's say, two or three coming and meeting in the middle at where that tumor is. I could just draw this out, right? So like, let's say that the tumor is right here, this circle. And I'm going to shine a laser here, but like at like, let's say one fourth power, one here at one fourth power, from here at one fourth power, and from here at one fourth power. So right here in the middle is going to be 100% power, right? Um, but it's not going to be uh, uh, strong enough to kill that tissue. So it's essentially the same solution as what you see here. You don't go in full force, you go in at a reduced force and meet in the middle. So when so this is an example of an analogy. An analogy is any and you've you've seen analogies because on you know standardized tests like the SAT uh, you see them um, where you have to kind of draw comparisons and generalize across different ideas. And so this is exactly what we are doing here. Uh, and people tend to underuse analogies whenever they are problem solving. Um, instead, they're more likely to. Um, uh, uh, use mental shortcuts and things like that. Um, but you are more likely to reach the solution if you have engaged with a similar problem in the past. Um, so here in this figure right here, what you're looking at is if I just showed you that first uh, problem and then just left you there, about 10% of folks would get that correct. But those, but uh, what we just did, where you got the analogous problem, and I gave you su the suggestion that it might help, that goes from 10% solving it up to, what is this, about 75% or so solving it. So a huge increase, right? If I just gave you that problem, you know, the, the problem with di the dictator, if I gave it to you last week, and then I asked you again, you know, about the laser one this week, um, we'd have an increase of about 20%, which is actually great, um, but not nearly as much as what we would see um, in the other condition. So the book refers to this as focusing on the deep structure of that problem. That is referring to the key mechanisms that these problems have in common. Uh, in other words, that if you go full force, is going to disrupt, you know, um, uh, things, whether it be the army or the tissue uh, in, in those problems. So we have to think about what kind of common principles do these problems uh, have. And the book refers to this as the relational mindset, with the relational mindset being that you are thinking about the relationship that these items and principles have together. Alrighty, let's talk about how we view these problems, how we picture them. Here is a very famous um, 
uh, uh, problem, usually called the candle problem. Uh, and I got two videos for you here. Um, they are this pretty much the same thing. So it really depends on your flavor if you want to check them out. You don't have to. Um, but the Brain Games vid is uh, watching somebody do this. The TED Talk vid is a guy explaining uh, this problem and then about how if you give somebody money uh, for, for solving this, if you were to make it into a competition, that that actually causes people to solve it slower than if you let somebody just kind of play around uh, with it. Um, so interesting videos, uh, but here is the task. You were given ob the object shown, a candle, a book, a, bu <laughs> a book of matches, and a box of tacks. Your task is to find a way to attach the candle to the wall of the room at eye level so it will burn properly, uh, properly and illuminate the room. So here is what you have. A box of tacks with tacks in it, um, a matchbook, and a candle, and uh, a table. So you can try imagining this. Have we already done this this semester? I feel like maybe we have. Um, but um, usually what happens is people will say very quickly, I have the solution. This is very easy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this candle and I'm going to put it on the wall and I'm going to make it really hot and have some wax run down the side and stick it to the wall. Boom. Or I'm going to take these thumbtacks and I'm going to tack it into the wall or whatever. That's fine, but it's going to burn your house down. So it's not a good legitimate solution, right? Because it's going to burn the house uh, if you were to do that. Um, so, how can you do this without burning down your house? Here is the solution, which again, most people don't like to hear because they feel like it's cheating. Where you take the, the box of tacks, you empty out the tacks, and you use that box to be something like a um, frame or a, uh, like a, a ledge or you know, a shelf or whatever. And that way you can put the candle on top of uh, that, that box of tacks uh, and it'll burn all the way down to the, to the bottom without setting your house on fire. Maybe when it gets down to the bottom, it might set your house on fire. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but uh, this is uh, the solution. Now, the reason why people don't like this, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you why people don't like it. I'm going to give you one more uh, example here. So here is another example also mentioned in your books. If you read ahead uh, of watching this, then you've ruined it for yourself. You spoiled it, and you already know the answer. You enter a room in which two strings are hanging from the ceiling and a pair of pliers is lying on the table. Your task is to tie the two strings together. Unfortunately, uh, the, the strings are positioned far enough apart so that you can't grab one string and hold on it while reaching for the other. So how do you tie them together? And every time I show this in the classroom, any kind of variation of this actually, uh, people are always convinced, they're always like, no, you can reach across, you can, you know, if this person wanted to, they could hold on to the very bottom here and reach over and grab it. And I always have to say like, okay, but just imagine, <laughs> you know, just, um, just imagine that this person couldn't reach. Um, so how would they do it? Um, the way that, th and again, students sometimes find this unsatisfying, but if you were to encounter this in the real world and you were actually given this task, here's how you could do it. Ultimately what you have to do in this task is grab those pliers, tie them to one end of the string, and then you know, swing it out so that it swings back to you and then that way you can grab it while holding on to this other one and boom, there you go, you have both strings now and then you can tie them together. Uh, so that is referred to as functional fixedness. Um, so functional fixedness is our tendency to think about what these objects do in their normal everyday functions and we, because of that we don't think about what other uses they could have. So if we think about the problem uh, of the candle, um, and the reason why this is tricky is because when we see this box of matches, we just think about the box as being the container for the, for the, the tax, right? Uh, we don't think about it as serving its own purpose like what you see here on the side. Um, similarly here, we think about the pliers as maybe a way that we could like pinch this string or even kind of pinch this and pull it or something. Um, we don't think about it being like a, a counterweight that we can use to swing uh, so that we can get that string closer uh, to us. Um, all right, uh, so that is functional fixedness. Uh, functional fixedness is that we just think about things um, in one set way and we don't think about the other ways that we could be using them. Um, and I, I'm not trying to give away 
a, a potential quiz or test answer, so I gotta I gotta think. Um, but like one example would be like if you um, have like a big screw that is not going, you don't have a screwdriver for, you can maybe use a dime and you know and use that to screw it in. That's an example. The reason why that's functional fixedness is because you're using something that has a function. That dime, its function is currency. It's not hardware. It's not tool hardware, right? But we're using that for a new purpose uh, and breaking out of how we normally saw it. So we are transcending functional fixedness in that way. Um, so in this, so here the problem is our mindset, right? It is how we are viewing the problem that is causing the issue. Uh, this is referred to uh, the way that we see problems is referred to as Einstellung, uh, also called the problem sets. And this is uh, the kind of assumptions that we make about a problem here. You may have seen uh, this example before where you have to uh, draw four straight lines passing through all nine dots. And the key is that you can't lift your pencil from the page. Uh, and so people <laughs> are usually kind of confounded here. So let's try this. So go ahead and try this out if you want to. You know, like pause it, open up the, the PowerPoint, draw here and see how you do. Um, if I remember off the top of my head, ooh, I, I know the general shape, so I might have to try a couple of a couple of, of instances here. It's going to be something like, let's see, four lines. It's going to be something like Yeah, that's it, I think. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Yep, so there you go. So this would go, and I, I missed this one here, but you, you can see where I'm trying to go with that. I'm just not a good artist. Uh, but this would this would solve your problem, right? But people generally don't do it this way, or it doesn't occur to them, because they think of the problem set, or the Einstellung, uh, as being, like it has to be within these dots, and it can't be outside of these dots. It feels like we're cheating a little bit whenever we're, you know, like going down this far, right? Uh, so that we can like draw a straight line here. It feels like we've done something wrong uh, because we do not view that in our problems. That we think that the, the, the whole problem has to exist within this small cube here. Here is another example uh, of a problem set. So let so th there are 62 squares on this chessboard, as you see over here. We have 31 dominoes, uh, and uh, you can see that the top left square and the bottom right square have been removed. Uh, so that means that we had, s you know, this is eight rows by eight rows. So do the math. Can I, if I were to put one domino on the on on the table at a time, and each domino is going to cover two squares? So if they, if we know they cover two squares, could you fit every single domino on that board? The answer is no. Uh, we can't actually do that. And if you try doing the math you may you know because I know it's it's kind of popular like okay well there this is 8 by 8 so 8 by 8 means that we have 64 and we removed two of these squares which means we have 62 and we have 31 dominoes each with two sides which means that we got 62 boom that feels right it feels I know almost just convinced me that this is possible but it's not possible and the reason why is because of your Einstellung is because of the problem set, the way that you're thinking about this problem. So if we think about this domino as each one of these has uh, a black uh, half and a white half, each of them has that, then when you look at this um, chessboard, that this white piece was moved and this white piece was moved, right? So that means that we can't actually put all of them on there because we know that each domino would roughly be able to cover one black and one white, and here two white are missing, which means that we're going to have more black squares uh, uh, occupied than white squares. Um, all right, so um, I, I think about this like the Abraham Maslow quote. If you don't know Abraham Maslow, very important um, uh, humanistic psychologist from the 60s and 70s and 80s onward. He came up with the, um, uh, the pyramid of... Uh, 
I forgot what it is because it's totally made up and not true. What is it called? Hierarchy of Needs. Um, so the Hierarchy of Needs, if you've heard that before, is Abraham Maslow. But he also has this quote, which is something along the lines of, when all you have is a hammer, everything in the world looks like a nail. And the point of that, when all you have is a hammer, the entire world looks like a nail, is that when you have one tool, everything that you come across in life, you feel like you can use that one tool to solve your problems. Right? So if all you have is money, then money can solve all of your problems. Right? If you're somebody who is really, really strong, then maybe you think that strength is the way that you can solve every problem. Right? Um, uh, if, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, so that's a way of thinking about problem sets, is that whenever we view the world, uh, or whenever we, whenever we know what we have, we might view the world a specific way uh, because of our um, biased past experiences. Uh, so it can be good and bad to kind of draw from things from our previous experience like this. It can be good because it can save us time because we don't have to go through and relearn everything, but it can also cost us time because we're likely to repeat old bad methods. Uh, so in this case, you know, we're using math, which might be good for other problems, but it's not good for this problem. Uh, likewise here, um, that in those cases, um, uh, if we're thinking about other previous examples like that, they can actually cost us some time. And this is an example of where creativity can help. With creativity, you're getting um, a lot of different, um, different kinds of responses here, and those different kinds of responses um, can be new and interesting and can help sometimes unlock the problem. All right, so let's spend a very short amount of time on creativity and thinking. Um, the book goes through a couple of different stages of creativity, but I honestly don't feel super confident in that stuff just because um, it was like published in 1925, uh, back before we knew anything about how the brain works, you know? Um, but what we know today is that a lot of creativity is actually influenced by memory, which might be surprising to some of you, because when we think about creativity, or at least when I think about creativity, I think about this as being like somebody's personality type, right? That like, it doesn't matter, you know, what their memory or attention is, that creativity is creativity. But the book makes a pretty persuasive argument that creativity uh, relies on other kinds of processes that are more basic in order for them to occur. So, um, uh, what, some ways we can think about this is that creative people might try to think about other kinds of um, problems they have encountered and might try to draw connections there, you know, thinking about the deep framework um, of, or the deep mapping uh, of that particular problem series. And that is called convergent thinking, where you're kind of putting these connections together. But other creatives can try to solve problems by doing the opposite, kind of, which is that instead of thinking about what they've done in the past, try throwing out novel, completely new, um, unpredictable ideas. And that is called divergent thinking. Um, and that can also help you uh, um, uh, come up with a, with a solution whenever you're doing that. And uh, here are some prerequisites that the book lists from case studies that were done with highly creative people, some alive, some uh, some dead. And essentially here are these, and I know that they are very vague, um, but uh, basically if you want someone to, to be creative, they need to have knowledge and skill from the domain that they are working in. So if they want to be creative and a painter, they need to have knowledge about how paint works, how it dries, how it spreads across a brush. Um, they also need to have certain kinds of personality traits and individual differences, such as a willingness to take risks or the willingness to ignore criticism. Uh, they are intrinsic. Uh, they are motivated motivated by intrinsic rewards, which means that they like to do things because the act of doing it is pleasurable and satisfying. Uh, like uh, a lot of video games are intrinsically rewarding. You don't need to be rewarded with money to play a video game, right? Just doing it makes you know makes you feel good and, and you like doing it. Um, and there can also be, and this is kind of frustrating because there's nothing you can really do about it, there can also be situational factors that can uh, influence this. So being at the right place at the right time. 
This is so true. Does you take an art history? No, this is absolutely true for a lot of um, uh, painters, uh, especially before the 1900s. So much of it was folks being in the right place at the right time. If you think about like Monet, for example, and French Impressionism, they were in the right place at the right time in the right part of the world to get together and to form this new movement, right? Uh, somebody might have all the knowledge and ability and all the personality of Claude Monet, uh, but if they weren't in France at that sp or in Paris at that specific point uh, in human history, they may not have really developed and had that breakthrough uh, of impressionistic art. Uh, all right, so I'm trying to keep us moving here, but now's a good time to take a quick break in case you need to do that. Um, what we're going to do here is uh, talk about chapter 14. But we're really going to kind of talk about kind of the big broad pictures here. So what the heck is intelligence? Intelligence is very frustrating for me because y'all know me. I, I think um, in terms of research and quantif quantifiable things and empirical things stuff like that uh, because I'm a little bit of a nerd. Um, so whenever we talk about what intelligence is, it really depends. What intelligence is really depends on how you are measuring it, and that is. I know I've said that for things like I talked about that for memory, and I talked about it for attention, but that is so true for intelligence. It's more true than anything else we'll talk about this semester. That um, what intelligence is really depends on how you are deciding to measure it. So, for example, if you are using the IQ test, the Stanford Binet IQ test, the standardized test that you know has been used for a century now. Um, that is really only kind of predicting future success as defined by social economic status. So as defined by money and your standing in the community. Um, which means that the IQ test doesn't really tell us all that much about intelligence per se. It just tells us about how successful somebody might be in the future and the idea from the test is that the reason why they will have that future success is because they are intelligent. You can see how that's a little bit of circular reasoning there. Uh, and also not fair. Um, so uh, this, uh, this definition is, is fine, I think. Uh, that intelligence is the ability to reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, comprehend complex ideas, learn quickly, and learn from experience. But you can easily see how, if you wanted to, you could come up with ways to study each little one of these ideas, right? How, you know, how quickly can someone learn? How quickly can someone learn from experience? How quickly can someone comprehend complex ideas or, or think abstractly or solve problems or plan or use reasoning? Um, so it really, like I said, it really depends on how you are measuring uh, this construct and which of these constructs you are deciding to measure. Um, so intelligence scales today are not simple trivia. I feel like sometimes people think, and I feel like it is kind of a stereotype that like when we think about Jeopardy or other kinds of trivia based game shows, we think that people who do well in those shows are smart individuals. We think that they have high intelligence. But intelligence tests these days don't actually ask questions like what you see on Jeopardy or questions like you might see, you know, in uh, on a game show um, or at trivia at a bar. Um, instead, uh, a lot of the questions they ask are going to be more like the, the chicken, fox, and grain riddle, where you're trying to think in abstracts, you're trying to think using analogies and things like that. Um, and a lot of intelligence scales cover a lot of the cognitive processes we've already talked about this semester, such as memory and attention and your ability to use reasoning and decision making and to, to comprehend languages. Uh, and the most common intelligence scale used by psychologists today is called the WAIS, the W-A-I-S, and it stands for this, the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale. Um, it's used most commonly for diagnosis and learning impairments that people can usually get kind of set up with individualized uh, education plans and things like that. Uh, but the idea here is that intelligence isn't really made up of one thing. It's just multiple things kind of spread across um, our behavior and our cognition. Uh, so it doesn't just give us one score, the, the waste doesn't, um, it, the IQ test does. It just says like, oh, you have a 110 IQ or you have a 97 IQ or whatever. 
Um, the waist, on the other hand, gives you lots of different scores. So that way you can kind of be more specific about um, the things that someone might need. So, um, uh, things someone might need in terms of accommodations. Um, so, here is an example of the waist's breakdown. So, you are trying to talk about the IQ, the intelligence of someone, but that you are going to you calculate that by factoring in their performance IQ and their verbal IQ. So, two separate kinds of intelligences. One that is verbal in nature and one that is performance based. And if we further break it down, you can see that for verbal IQ we have a verbal comprehension test and we have a working memory test. Uh, and so the verbal comprehension test is going to, or, or index, I should say, is kind of like verbal comprehension IQ versus working memory IQ. That doing this cluster means that you are answering questions about vocabulary, about analogies with similarities, about information processing, and about comprehension. If you're doing the working memory IQ, then you are doing arithmetic, you're doing digit span, and you are sequencing numbers and things like that. I'm going to fast forward for a second here. Um, if you click this link uh, for the very well-mined uh, Westler Dull Intelligence Scale, it's just an, an exterior link uh, that tells you about more about you know where you can find the waste and things like that. Some of you have taken it before, some of you haven't. Um, but uh, I used to try to link to the official website, but the official website is down so much uh, that I, I didn't want to include it here because it's so unreliable. Um, but uh, if you wanted to buy the waste, uh, so you could administer it yourself. Um, it's only fifteen hundred bucks. <laughs> That's nuts, right? You have to buy. Yet this, these questions cost over one thousand dollars. So why is that? Part of it is because it's so specific, right? Um, and so what we were just talking about is the verbal IQ. So being able to think about these things in words and and to articulate them and to say them out loud. Performance IQ, on the other hand, is a little bit trickier to quantify. So um, processing speed would be an example of performance IQ, or your ability to perceive uh, things around you is also a measurement of your IQ. And we, you can see the different kinds of tests that exist for that down here. Uh, so that is an example of a more modern approach to intelligence testing, where you're not just getting really one score, you're getting these smaller scores so you can tell somebody, hey, you have great verbal IQ, but your performance IQ is kind of bad. Let's get you set up with some accommodations so that you can plan around that. Um, you can't, or you're not supposed to look very much at uh, this test um, before you take it. And the reason why is because by looking at it, you can study for it or you can be prepared for it. And then you're not getting a clear image of someone's intelligence that way, right? Um, so, um, the digit span task we did earlier in the semester. This is where like you you get a list of numbers and you have to report them in the order in which you heard, right? Um, but this the the waste also has another test where you're doing digit span, but you're reporting them in the numbers from lowest to highest. So if I read to you the you know uh, nine seven eight, you would repeat back seven eight nine. Um, the symbol searching, so basically the visual search task that we did early in the semester, uh, that was an example of something you might see in the waste. And matrix reasoning. Matrix reasoning is is all about drawing comparisons and analogies across different stimulus classes. So looking at, for example, these eight patterns, which of those do you think, which, which of these eight down here belongs in this missing piece? So if you're looking at it, I'll give you a second to look at it. The way that you would solve this one is, which one are you going to use? You're going to use this one? I don't think so. Uh, here we're moving from uh, three lines, one line, no lines. Weird. Uh, or we have, we could say that this is two and one and something else. So it looks like maybe we're missing a two and a three here. No, hold on. I think I screwed something up that we're missing a 3 and a 1. So we don't have a 1 over here, and we don't have a 3 or a 2 over here. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so the best answer from the ones that we down, have down here is, sorry, let me take a quick look. It is going to be 
Oh, this is actually a little bit trickier than I thought that it was going to be. Interesting. That's what I get for, for trying this late at night. So, um, all right. So let's take a quick look at moving across. What do we see here? So this one, we have two on top of one, right? So these two lines on top of that line back there. Here we have three on top of three. And here we have... I can't tell. This looks like it's probably a one on top of two. And so we have two, three, and one, and one, three, and two. So we have all the numbers here. We have the same thing here. So we have uh, this looks like three on top of one, maybe. This one looks like, I don't know, two on top of two. And this one looks like one on top of three. And again, those move over. Uh, they, they track. So here we have two on top of three. Here we have one on top of one which means that here we should have three on top of two. So which of these do we have three on top of two? I think maybe the best answer here is, is it this one? Hmm, I have to think about it, but I think it, I think it might, I think I might be wrong. I think I might be wrong, but I'm gonna go with that one for you. But basically, you would do this, you, there's 40 of these you could try, where basically what you're looking for is the pattern here and you're seeing which of those would fit in here. You can try it with these other ones. This one right here is much easier than the others. Uh, this one is actually much easier than that one too. Uh, so give it a try. Uh, and so this would be a performance IQ idea, right? Because you, you don't need language in order to solve uh, this one. So uh, usually whenever psychologists administer the waste, it is done in a super standardized way. Um, and it, that's like they have a booklet you know you pay 1500 bucks just to buy this kit so um, it better tell you better have a really good instruction book right so uh, the instructions are written out for you and it tells you what you can say and what you can't say it gives you very scripted narratives that you have to read and instructions you have to read word for word if you uh, mispronounce a word if you stumble over your words you have to start back at the beginning and reset things um, so it's very very picky uh, and if you get things right, they don't say like, ah, oh, congratulations, or yeah, that's right. They usually will say things like, good job working on that, which feels so, so neutral, right? Um, so uh, the WACE is meant to, and the reason why it's so standardized that way is so that way we can make sure that, you know, um, that everybody's getting the exact same treatment so that any differences between their scores might speak to intelligence differences or I should say maybe say performance IQ or verbal IQ differences compared to this person smarter than this person or whatever. And this isn't really something you can do online. Now I say that and a lot of what I know about the WACE is because I did a lot of work um, with it in grad school, which was obviously before the COVID pandemic and things became increasingly administered online. So you might be able to do this online these days, but I, I don't know uh, if, if you can or not. Um, and so another nice thing about the WACE is that because it gives you the performance IQ and the verbal IQ and not just one singular IQ, that this can actually tell us what our strengths and weaknesses are so we can develop uh, you know, different kinds of individualized education plans and things like that. So IQ is a measure of what they call general, general intelligence, which is that your intelligence can be put into one score. But this is becoming an increasingly outdated um, uh, uh, perspective on intelligence. Instead, um, sorry, I think I have a hair in my mouth. I'm going to have to try to struggle through it uh, for the rest of the chapter. Um, so this is kind of an outdated view. Today, I think more people will embrace um, multiple measures of intelligence. Um, the ones that we're going to go over here are fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Sometimes people want to talk about gardeners multiple intelligence. Um, and honestly, I feel like a lot of education majors uh, ask me about that. And I always feel bad because I tell them, yeah, most of the modern research on this is not accurate. Like, it, gar gardeners intelligence isn't really a commonly practiced um, theoretical framework that's used very much these days, uh, or at least in research and our understanding of how the brain works, but it's still used a lot in, in, in education. Um, so we're going to focus on this kind of two-sided model of intelligence, which is looking at fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence you can think of as kind of like your street smarts, if you ever heard that expression. 
that's still an expression, right? Like, I feel like that was, people said that when they were growing up. Um, when I was growing up, I should say. And crystallized intelligence is like your book smarts. So think of fluid intelligence as like how quick how quick on your feet are you? Um, how 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 easily can you go with the flow? Crystallized intelligence is how much acquired knowledge you have, and so that's going to be stuff like trivia uh, and other encyclopedic knowledge and information and facts that you've gained throughout your life. Um, also, those of you that, that follow the NFL, you may have heard of in a, uh, quarterback IQ or QB IQ. The idea is to look at, you know, like how aware and attentive and smart, uh, quote unquote, is the quarterback on the team. Um, and if you think about being a quarterback, a lot of that is fluid intelligence, right? It's thinking on your feet, being able to apply new strategies to solve people you've never played against and things like that. Crystallized intelligence, on the other hand, is simply like what you've learned. So if I were to ask you, you know, like, what'd you learn from chapter 12? Uh, that would be an example of crystallized intelligence. It's something that isn't about creating new solutions or new, or, you know, trying, trying out new problems. It's more about kind of um, how much do you know? All right, so this is a fascinating figure to me. What you're looking at right here on the x-axis is how old these participants are. And the z-score is a standardized measure, don't worry too much about it. It's just a way to make sure that these scales um, have comparable starting and uh, starting points. Uh, so we're looking at uh, vocabulary tests, tests that uh, look at speed performance, tests that look at reasoning, and tests that look at memory. And what we find is that over the years, all of these tests have worse performance except for this test for vocabulary, that our vocabulary generally gets better and better we have this crystallized intelligence of vocabulary. But fluid intelligence starts getting worse as we move into teenage years and our young adulthood. Um, and uh, as we get older, it doesn't get better. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, so our ability to um, uh, do a speed performance or to use reasoning or, or memory uh, is gonna get worse as we get older, whereas our vocabulary roughly stays the same. And the final slide I want to show you here is kind of this interesting look at how um, in the environment can affect your IQ. And so we're looking at uh, before folks were adopted, and you can see there's essentially no difference, right? You're looking at the difference between these, that's like the difference between an 88, an 87, and an 86. So they're almost identical, right? But um, that's for uh, children that were not, uh, that were before they had been adopted. Uh, in this longitudinal study, they follow up with those families. They test them again with similar questions once they reach adolescence. And then now you can see some pretty big changes in the uh, uh, adoption outcomes here. But why is that? Part of the reason why is because we see over here that these, uh, um, uh, oh, where was I going <laughs> with this? Uh, so, so these kids, there are no differences. Those that were raised in a high social economic status had huge increases, right? Why is that? Probably because high social economic statuses are they're getting you know the best private schools, they're getting, you know, these private tutors, they have the best learning equipment they can bu possibly buy for their kids, whereas uh, kids that uh, are in low social economic status see very little change in their IQ uh, from before they were adopted. So, yes, the environment does matter, um, but we still have a very small understanding of that at this point. And that is it. So that is all that I wanted to say before we get to chapter 15. Uh, chapter 15 is all about uh, in, uh, thinking. Uh, thoughts that we are aware of and thoughts that we are not aware of. I'll quickly point out uh, this video right here, this BBC documentary for Battle of the Brains. This link sometimes goes dead, uh, so you might have to search for it separately if it's the hour that it's down, because it's so unpredictable when it's online and when it's not, is a BBC documentary where they essentially get, I think, six or seven world experts in something, and then they make them compete in a series of puzzles to see who is the smartest. So they have, like, a music prodigy, they have a chess grandmaster, they have a Navy fighter pilot, they have a theoretical physicist, and things like that. So it's, it's really cool, because they're all competing together. And I also have a, a bunch of unused slides in case you want to learn more about problem solving. Uh, and I didn't uh, satisfy your hunger for that. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I think that's all that I want to talk about with you today. So um, 
I will see you later. Have a great day. We got one more chapter left.